Hello everyone. Today we're going to talk about the Protestant Reformation, a protest against church abuses and a reform movement in the Christian Church. In order to really understand the Protestant Reformation, you have to know what came before. What laid the foundations for this movement? In order to know that, you have to look back to the Middle Ages. Now, the Middle Ages is sometimes known as the Age of Faith because everybody's focus was on heaven. God, faith, and the church was central to everything, to your life, to your actions, to your thought. The idea was that everybody was a sinner trying to make his way to heaven, and the church was vital to that. The church told you the things you needed to do to get to heaven. You needed to, for example, do good deeds, go to confession, and so on. You needed to do all of these things to earn your way. Well, we get to the later Middle Ages. And there are several things that occur that start to make people question the church. And let me add also that if you were a Christian in Europe during the Middle Ages and the years leading up to the Protestant Reformation, you were a Roman Catholic. That's the only church there was. Now, in the later Middle Ages, as I said, there are several things that occur that start to make people question. In the 1300s, the bubonic plague sweeps through Europe. And the aftermath of this really makes people question their place and their focus. And people began to realize that they could be dead by tomorrow, by tonight. And so the mindset starts to change. Instead of living your life trying to get to the next life, heaven, the idea emerges that maybe you could live your life for the moment. Enjoy life to the fullest now. Kind of like YOLO of the Middle Ages. Um, you know, do, do what you want to do. Make yourself happy. Accomplish great things now. There's no need to wait. So this mindset begins to change. Now there was also um, there were also several incidents regarding corruption and problems in the church. For example, you have the Babylonian captivity also in the 1300s, and this was a period of time um, spanning decades where the popes lived in France under the thumb of the French king. Um, it started when the French king actually kidnapped a pope and brought him to France. But then in the subsequent decades, all of the popes are French, chosen by the French king, answering to the French king, living in luxury in a palace, and making people question the vows of poverty that these clergy members took. This is followed immediately by the Great Schism, a period of time when you have two popes and then three popes and for a brief time even four popes, making people again question the sanctity of the church. This leads into the Renaissance, and the Renaissance was a period of rebirth following the Middle Ages, and the central cultural movement of the Renaissance was humanism, the idea that man takes center stage, not God, not the church, but man, man the individual. The Renaissance is also a period of time when people question everything. They question the world around them. They want to know more. They question why things are the way they are. Now, if you went to church in the Middle Ages, your church services would be held in Latin. Most people did not understand Latin. And for that reason, most people didn't really feel a connection to their faith, or many people did not. Also, the Middle Ages is a period of illiteracy. The only people who could really read or write were people at the top of society. Many of the clergy members, some of the nobility, the majority of the population did not read or write. That means they were totally dependent on what they were told in regards to information. And all of this is going to change as a result of the Protestant Reformation. One of the um, pieces of technology that emerges during the Renaissance is the printing press. 
Johannes Gutenberg, in 1450, created the movable type printing press. At the same time, there was a new, cheaper type of paper developed. And what this meant was that books could be mass produced for the first time. And so what we see happening is all of these books being printed, people gradually start to learn to read and write, they're becoming educated, they want to know about the world around them. They want to know everything, and they're reading, and they're reading, and they're thinking for themselves. And the book that everybody has in his or her home is the Bible. For the first time, people can read, and can read this for themselves. They can think about it and question. These are the terms for this lecture. As with all the lectures, you need to know all of these terms. They are the building blocks of each lecture, the outline of sorts. So you will need to know the who, what, when, where, and why um, of each of them, the why being the significance. And so I'll give you a few moments to write them down. So as a little recap, here's some general background to the Protestant Reformation. In medieval times, Catholic Christianity dominated the lives of people. As I said, there's only one church, and it's the central focus of everything. Most people are uneducated, and because of that, they're totally dependent on what they're being told. They're also taught not to question, and so their understanding of Christianity is often distorted. Um, it's a period of superstition, so a lot of times their understanding of Christianity is distorted with superstitions and imaginary concepts. For example, relics were sold by the Catholic Church, and a relic would be the finger bone of St. Peter. There were thousands of finger bones of St. Peter floating around Europe. And the church would tell people, if you pray to this finger, to St. Peter's finger, at a certain time, you will have good luck and good health. And people believed that. And so they would plunk down their hard-earned money, buy these relics, and pray at the appointed time. And then the major concern of everybody in their daily lives was fear of damnation in the afterlife. So for that reason, you need to do everything possible to be good and to earn your way. Our story starts with Martin Luther. So who was Martin Luther? Well, he was born in 1483 in central Germany. And I will say that there actually was not a country of Germany as there is today. Instead, there's what was called the Holy Roman Empire. And this was a very large empire um, spanning what's today Germany, Austria, parts of France and Italy, and um, some other areas. There was an emperor, the Holy Roman Emperor. Now, within this empire, you have all these independent states. And each of these independent states was ruled by a prince who answered to the Holy Roman Emperor. It's kind of like the United States. We have a president but then 50 individual states governed by a governor. And so it's kind of the same concept. But Martin Luther was born in one of these German states. And he was born to an upper-class um, peasant family. His father, Hans, was a successful mine owner. And he really wanted his son to make something of himself. Hans wanted Martin to have an education. So, and, and he just had really high ambitions for his son. So eventually, Martin went to the university, and there, for the first time, he was exposed to a humanistic education. At the university, he was exposed to the thinking of a number of theologians. But Martin questioned a lot of the ideas that he was given. And one of the things that he questioned was the ideas that the church were um, selling to people. The ideas like, um, like I said, if you pray to this relic at a certain time, you will get to heaven. Or you will have good health and good fortune. If you do good works, you will go a lot, that will go a long way towards getting you to heaven. 
And so he really began to question the church, but at the same time, he was very, very devout. He was very religious, um, and faith was central to his life. Now, his father wanted Martin to study law, but he wasn't real nuts about the idea. He was an obedient son, though, so he did go off to law school. And it's during that time that he was traveling home, and he was caught in a horrible thunderstorm. So it was very different from today. You know, we get along around by plane, train, automobile. Back then, if you're traveling, you walk, you ride a horse or a cart. Well, Martin's walking. And he's out in the middle of nowhere. A horrible thunderstorm hits, and he's trapped. And he is convinced that he is going to die out there. And so he prays to his favorite saint. And he says, please, please, let me live. If you let me live, I will devote my life to God. Part of his problem was that he was terrified about the status of his own salvation. He was afraid that if he died at that moment, he would not be saved, but would burn in hell. And so, he ends up abandoning the study of law. I'm sure his father wasn't real happy. Um, and he joined a monastery, and he threw himself into the monastic life. Unfortunately, monastic life didn't erase the fear and the unhappiness and the uncertainty that he felt about the, the future of his soul. He deeply felt the sin that he had, and he believed that it couldn't be cast off just by doing good works. And he began to wonder how good works or how good deeds could really be good if they were being done by a sinful person. And he wondered how they could really be good if they were only being done to get into heaven. You know, if people didn't really mean it. Well, every night Martin would go to his cell, his little room in the monastery, and he would study the Bible. And he was just searching and searching for an answer, a way out of his dilemma. And around 1513, he suddenly found his answer. He opened his Bible to the book of Romans in the New Testament, to Romans 117. And a passage just leapt out at him, the just shall live by faith. So I want you to think for a moment about what that might mean. Well, to Martin Luther what it meant was that the key to salvation was faith and faith alone. So what does that mean about the Catholic Church and everything the Church said you needed to do to get to heaven? Well, Martin Luther believed that all the other stuff, the confession, good deeds, pilgrimages, holy relics, and so forth, they were just window dressing. They're important, but they're not going to get you to heaven. It's your faith in Christ that will save you. He believed that faith is freely given to all Christians who want it. You don't have to earn it because it's given directly to each person. Now, this idea is going to have powerful ramifications because it eliminates the need for intermediaries. It means that the clergy are irrelevant in the question of whether or not your soul is going to be saved because they don't have personal power to save sinners. A bishop could not save you. Neither could the Pope. It also means that the rites of the Catholic Church, such as the sacraments, Mass, they don't on their own have power to save one soul. Martin Luther's own work and research and the Bible had solved his dilemma, not the clergy. And so Luther now considers the Bible to be the final arbiter of judgments about Christian doctrine. Now, Luther was very conservative, both personally and politically. He was not looking to make changes in society. And he also did not have a quarrel with his immediate supervisors. Now, during this time, Luther had continued his studies. He earned a doctorate in theology, and he became a professor at a university. He also was given the opportunity to travel to Rome with some other clergy members. 
and he was very, very excited. Um, I want you to think about a time that maybe you were given an opportunity to do something really exciting, something that you'd really been wanting to do for a long time and you build it up and you build it up in your mind and so by the time you embark on your journey or your quest you're so excited and you you feel this is going to be this amazing adventure well that's how it was for Martin Luther he's going to Rome the seat of the Catholic Church well he gets there and he's really deflated because what he sees are clergy members living in luxury now the clergy took vows of poverty. He sees clergy members living with women, married to women, having illegitimate children. Clergy members took vows of chastity. He sees the clergy on street corners selling relics and other items to people who really can't afford it. And just all in all, he was really, really disillusioned with everything that he saw in Rome and he returned home just really let down but he was obedient he had his faith and so he continued on with his studies and with his work. Martin Luther at this time was a professor of theology at the University of Wittenberg in one of the German states and in 1517 an issue arose that is going to thrust Martin Luther onto the world stage and push his own thinking to the brink. It's going to cause him to realize that he had to break with the Catholic Church. And the issue was that of indulgences granted by the Church. So what are indulgences? Indulgences were little certificates that the Roman Catholic Church sold to their believers. And an indulgence was based on the idea of purgatory. Purgatory was the Catholic belief in a middle ground, an intermediary point between heaven and hell, a temporary hell. The idea was that a person dies. He still has sin. His soul still has sin, so he cannot go to heaven. He goes to purgatory and remains there until the sin is gone, the soul repents, and then it's on to heaven. Well, the purpose of the indulgence was to erase some of that sin. So basically, people could buy these certificates. Each certificate, each indulgence, would erase some of that sin. You could buy them for yourself. You could buy them for people you know. Say you have a cousin, and he died last year, and he did not live a good life. So you know that he's in purgatory. Well, you could buy an indulgence for him and help him along his way. A lot of people criticized this practice. It was not based on the Bible. And even though the church said that the money was going um, for worthy projects, people criticized it and said, you know, this is just a way for the wealthy to buy their way into heaven. In 1517, a friar by the name of Johannes Tetzel came to Wittenberg selling the newest indulgence. And a lot of people, as I said, really didn't agree with the, the idea of indulgences. They felt there was a very unspiritual way of doing things. But nevertheless, Tetzel um, would go from town to town selling the indulgences. And he comes to Wittenberg selling a brand new one, the proceeds of which were to be used to restore St. Um, Peter's Cathedral in Rome. But, as Martin Luther discovered, only half the proceeds were actually going to Rome to refurbish St. Peter's. The rest were being used to pay off a gambling debt incurred by the Archbishop of Mainz. So here comes Tetzel, and when he would go from town to town, it was like a circus sideshow because he'd have other clergy members with him. There would be some waving bells, ringing bells, some banging on a drum. Um, you'd have a couple of them carrying a big brass-bound chest that held all of the indulgences being sold. Another would be carrying a velvet cushion, and lying on that cushion was the newest indulgence. And then here would come Tetzel. 
Tetzel would come to town with his circus sideshow and he would sing out when a coin in the coffer rings a soul from purgatory springs and then basically give me your money and people would flock to him buying the newest indulgence and Martin Luther was furious because he felt this was wrong and this is the incident that's going to cause him to react this is the straw that breaks his back. The indulgences were, as I said, a fundraiser for the Catholic Church, supposedly. In reality, they were paying for the arts and lavish lifestyles of the church leaders. Again, they were supposed to reduce or cancel the punishment for sins or even future sins. So, you know, that meant that you could go buy an indulgence and then do something you're not supposed to do, but you're covered. And overall, they ensure your admission to heaven. And again, Martin Luther, Martin Luther disagreed with all of this. So he sits down and he writes out a list of 95 arguments against the Catholic Church. And these were called the 95 Theses. The 95 Theses stated all of Luther's objections to things like granting indulgences, the powers of the Pope. He talked about things such as um, the clergy had no special powers when it came to salvation. It was a direct attack against the Pope and the Church. The theses argued that salvation came by faith alone. And as I said, the clergy were no better off than any other individual as far as individual salvation. So he writes out his list, and the story goes that he nailed them to the church or university door in Wittenberg. Now, he may or may not have done this. Um, the story goes that he did. And I say the church slash university door because it was one and the same. And it was also, I will add, not unusual for someone to post information here because it was where it was kind of like a bulletin board of sorts. If you wanted information to get out, this is where you put it. So he does this on October 31st of 1517. And the ideas contained in the 95 Theses are going to spread very, very quickly. One contemporary writer wrote, it almost appears as if the angels themselves had been the messengers and brought them before the eyes of all the people, and them referring to the ideas contained in the 95 Theses. By December 1st of 1517, nearly everyone in the German states knew about Martin Luther's ideas. They were discussing his ideas, and they liked his ideas. Why does everyone know? How do they know? Well, it's because of the printing press. And this is a connection that you can see. The printing press, as I said, was developed in 1450. In the 67 years between that and the 95 Theses, the majority of the population has become literate. And that means that Martin Luther is speaking to a literate audience. These people can read his ideas. They have read the Bible for themselves. They can think for themselves. And they're discussing what he's talking about. After December, the ideas spread beyond the boundaries of the Holy Roman Empire to the rest of Europe. Um, they were quickly translated and widely dispersed. And um, in Germany, in fact, they were printed in the vernacular, which is the common language that the people wrote and spoke. And his views became very, very popular. The German nobles and princes really appreciated Luther's message because they did not like being taxed by the church. They didn't like the power that the Pope and Rome had over them. And this resentment against church authority laid a nice foundation for Luther's views. The church was not happy at all. The church demanded that Luther recant, but he refused. And Basically, the Pope tells the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V, um, and they were very close, 
Um, he tells Charles V, you, you get this Luther guy in there and you get him to recant, get him to take everything back. Um, eventually a trial will be held. Luther is brought in and he refuses to recant. I will say too that these these incidents I'm talking about regarding the trial and whatnot, this occurred over a span of time. This wasn't all within a week or so. Um, but for the purpose of our lecture, I'm kind of condensing what happened. But Charles does haul Martin Luther in, tries to get him to recant. Luther refuses. He said, unless I am convinced by error of the clear testimony of Scripture, or by clear reason, God help me, amen. He says, I cannot submit my faith either to the Pope or to the councils, because it is clear as day they have frequently erred and contradicted each other. Unless, therefore, I am convinced by the testimony of Scripture, I can and will not retract. Here I stand, I can do no other. So help me God. Amen. So what he's saying is that, no, I'm not taking anything back. And unless you can show me in the Bible where anything regarding indulgences, the power of the papacy, etc., where any of that's in there, I'm not going to take anything back. And so Martin Luther stood firm. The Pope, as you can imagine, wasn't happy. So the Pope at the time was Pope Leo X. He, again, asked Luther to recant. Luther refuses. So the Pope issued a papal bull, that's an official document, and it excommunicated Luther. And what that means is that Luther is basically kicked out of the church, which is really, really bad for a person living during this time, and especially someone like Martin Luther, who's very devout. Well, Luther responds by ripping up the bill of excommunication, saying, I cannot and will not recant anything. And then he calls the Pope the Antichrist and the church hierarchy a den of thieves. Well, he's going to end up founding a new church, the Lutheran Church, based on the idea of justification of faith. And justification of faith is the idea that all you need is your faith in Christ. That is what will get you to heaven. What saves Luther is the political conditions in Germany at the time, um, in the Holy Roman Emperor, Empire. This is still ruled in an almost feudal style, and Luther had the favor of one of the most powerful princes in Germany. And this is um, a prince named Frederick the Wise, and he kidnaps Luther for his own safety. Kidnaps him, I say, because there was a price on Luther's head. Um, the church is furious with him. They feel that he is a dangerous person because of the ideas he has, and they want him gone. And so Frederick kidnaps Luther and hides him away in his castle until everything blows over. While living there in Wartburg Castle, Luther goes by the name Junker George. And this may sound funny, but Junker was actually a title used by the German nobles. It signified that you were in the upper class. He uses his time wisely, and while he's there, he begins to translate the New Testament from Greek to German. And amazingly, he does this in just a few weeks. This is really important because it's going to make the Bible available to even more people because they'll be able to read it in the vernacular, in German. Luther went to great lengths to spread his ideas and to look for support within the Christian nobility of the German states. And he wrote a pamphlet called The Address to the Christian Nobility, also while he was at Wartburg Castle. And he used this to spread his ideas, gain the support of the nobility, and in this pamphlet, he rejects the authority of the Pope. This idea really appealed to the princes. Like I said, a lot of them, many of them were loyal to the Pope, but many of them resented the Pope and the power that he had over them. 
And so Luther's ideas really appeal to them because it gives them more autonomy, more freedom, and independence. Unfortunately, there were some unintended byproducts to Luther's actions and ideas. Luther's followers um, soon came to be called Lutherans, as I said. They're soon well established across the German states, especially in the north. But there were groups of people living throughout these German states who really liked Luther's ideas and who, who really had a, a deep chord touched by what Luther was saying. They were ripe for his message. And these were the peasants living across the German states. There were many, many peasants who worked for the German nobles, and they were not treated well. And so these peasants had a resentment against all authority, really. And this resentment against authority spilled over um, and resulted in a massive revolt that spread all across the German states. It's called the Peasants' Revolt. Um, started in 1524, went into 1525. And even though Martin Luther was only talking about religion, these peasants, as I said, they saw a political message in what he was saying. And this fighting was brutal. More than 100,000 peasants died fighting. Um, it's going to be the largest, most widespread uprising until the French Revolution in 1789. Luther himself was horrified. This was not at all what he intended to happen. He didn't want to have anything to do with this. And so he urged the princes to do whatever they had to do to put down this rebellion. And they did. They used a lot of brutality. A lot of people died. Like I said, more than 100,000 peasants died just in the fighting alone. Um, but they do bring this revolt to an end. From that point forward, Luther's movement is strictly religious, not political. The ideas of the Reformation spread like wildfire with their greatest success in the northern part of Europe. Lutheranism was especially popular in places like Scandinavia. And along the way, other figures are going to emerge who also oppose traditional Catholic doctrine. And this chorus of dissenting voices began to be called Protestants, which simply came to mean anyone who rejected the teaching of the Catholic Church. And one of the most important of those figures was Ulrich Zwingli, who founded the Protestant Reformation in Switzerland. He claimed the independent development of doctrines and ideas that were almost identical to Luther. For example, he believed also in salvation by faith alone. No sales of indulgences. Um, he believed that the Bible, Bible was primary. And he ended up founding a theocracy in Zurich, Switzerland. And a theocracy is a form of government where there is no separation between church and state. The political leader is also the religious leader and vice versa. Sadly, fighting is going to break out in 1531 in Switzerland, um, fighting over Zwingli's rejection of the Catholic Church, and he is going to die in the fighting. And this is going to be symbolic of the future of the Reformation. The basic ideas, though, will remain. So, to kind of recap, the foundations for reform. Why did there need to be a reformation? Well, on the one hand, you've got things that helped it along. The Renaissance education, which emphasized critical thinking. People, as I said, are thinking for themselves, not just accepting blindly. The availability of printed books like the Bible and the rise of literacy. Humanist values and the increased focus on this life versus the afterlife. Then you've got the abuses of the church, Pope Leo X's lifestyle, and the lifestyles of the other clergy as well. Sales of indulgences, sales of relics, and something else I hadn't really mentioned, but sales of church offices. This was quite common. You didn't necessarily, you weren't necessarily given a high church position because you were the most qualified. 
although that was one way to do it. Um, but you could also buy your way in. You know, say you have this nephew who he just cannot hold a job, and so you you're like, you know, okay, I'll put him to work, and you give him a position as a priest within the church. Is he as qualified as that guy next to him? Not at all. And this is going to become a huge problem. And so all of these things together are abuses which are going to um, point to the corruption within the church and make people like Martin Luther and Zwingli realize change needs to be had. We need change. So what are the main ideas of the Protestants? What sets them apart from the Roman Catholics? Well, the big idea is justification by faith. All you need to get to heaven is your faith. There's the supremacy of the Bible. The Bible is the final arbiter of, of everything. The Bible has, is the key. It has the answers you need. And again, because of the rising literacy, people are able to read this for themselves. The Catholic Church did not agree with this, but the Protestants firmly believed. Um, another thing that the Protestants believed was that ministers are important. You need someone in charge of a church, but their real job was to help educate the people so that they, in turn, could read the Bible for themselves. They also believed that ministers should be present. Um, another problem the Catholic Church had was that there would be bishops, for example, who were in control of churches who were nowhere near those churches. You might have a bishop living in Rome who was governing a church in a little town in France, but he visited maybe once a year, if that, meaning he really had no idea what was going on. And so the Protestants are like, we need to change that. You know, if you're governing a church, you need to be there with it, knowing what's going on. Martin Luther once said, I did not leave the church, the church left me. He never intended to start a reformation. He was a very devout Catholic. All he really wanted to do, all he ever wanted to do, was fix the problems. He just wanted to get rid of the problems in the church. But sadly, he reached a point where he recognized this just wasn't going to happen. And he was going to have to take a step and make change. And so Luther took the first great step by rejecting the power of the Pope. But then it's going to be other people like Zwingli who's going to take the next step to expand and add new vigor to the movement. And it's also symbolic that Zwingli is going to die on the battlefield defending his beliefs because war is going to accompany the Reformation movement as it spreads across Europe.